Okay. Greetings, Science of Sporters, and welcome to this episode 12 of my four minute mull, following hot on the heels of yesterday's episode 11, which makes these four minute mulls a little bit like London buses. You waited for a week and a half for the first one, and here's the second one immediately after it. The other way these miles have become like London buses is they basically never ever run on time, for which I apologize, but I'm going to stop waffling now and get straight to the point. Yesterday, we spoke a little bit about skinny cyclists, and specifically whether skinny cyclists who dominate modern cycling are a symptom of a shift in the doping paradigm around elite cycling performance. And the point there was that in the past, Doping was all about adding power output. EPO and blood doping allowed the cyclist to ride at a higher power output. The modern paradigm seems to be that you can take mass away. Now the end result is the same because you end up getting to the same watts per kilogram, the, the power to weight ratio which ultimately decides Tour de France and Walters and Giro's. But you do so from different directions. And the weight loss would be achieved through the use of corticosteroids, and other medical products and Ill illegitimate therapeutic use exemptions. The problem with this theory is that it's all conjecture. And part of the reason that it's conjecture is that there is currently no data with which to evaluate any aspect of it. Even the most basic question like, is the modern cyclist who wins the Tour de France in 2015, 16, 17, different in terms of body fat and leanness and muscle mass from the guy who was winning the Tour de France 10 years, 15 years, 20 years ago. We, we don't know that. And so that got me to thinking, and I reckon that it would be quite interesting and potentially very useful if the same principles that underpin the biological passport could be applied to body composition. So, biological passport for the uninitiated is an anti-doping tool whose premise is basically that instead of looking for the banned substance in the athlete's body, we look instead for the effect of that banned substance on the athlete's body. So that's a, that's a subtle but important difference. So let's take EPO for instance. That's a drug that athletes would take because they want to get a boost in red blood cell count. Now, instead of trying to find EPO in the blood or in the urine of the athlete, what we then look for is the red blood cell count. Things like the hematocrit, the hemoglobin, and then what are called immature red blood cells or reticulocytes. And the premise behind this is biological variation in the sense that there is an upper and a lower limit for how much biology varies over time. And therefore, if an athlete's blood goes from point A to point B and it exceeds what we consider to be typical variation, that would be flagged as a suspicious test. This is probably a horrendous analogy, but imagine you saw D Johnny Depp today and he looked like this and then you saw him again in a couple of weeks time and he looks like this, your conclusion is that Johnny Depp is wearing a wig. Because you understand that biologically, hair doesn't grow fast enough to explain that change. Same thing with the biological variation. So this is an example of what a passport would look like for a doper. And so the blue line represents that athlete's specific blood values. And so for instance, the hemoglobin is on the top left corner here. The reticulocytes or those immature red blood cells are on the bottom right. And the red lines either side of it represent those upper limits. And so those are the typical upper and lower boundaries that we would expect never to be crossed unless the athlete's doping. So have a look again. You can see that this athlete fairly regularly exceeds the upper or the lower limits. And they would be flagged either as suspicious or as outright doping. In contrast, this is what it looks like when an athlete is not doping. And there you can see that they remain within those boundaries. So, coming back to my brainwave of body composition, wouldn't it be interesting if we could somehow explore whether the same concept of normal or typical variation existed for things like losing fat, losing weight, without losing muscle? We know from the independent report into cycling that what athletes or cyclists are doing is they're going away and they're taking corticosteroids in order to lose four or five kilograms, four or five percent body fat, and then coming back without having lost power, but being considerably lighter. Now, that's, that four or five kilogram weight loss is no big deal if you started off weighing 120. No problem. But if you started off weighing 68, 
and your body fat percentage was eight or nine percent to begin with, then losing five kilograms and ending up at three and a half, four percent body fat, that starts to become a little bit challenging in the sense that it probably or potentially could only be achieved through the use of drugs and other medical products. Now, this would never be a definitive doping test because weight loss and fat percentage and muscle mass is subject to so many different factors. I, I recognize that it's multifactorial and complex, but I do think that with enough data, and there'd be, obviously there'd have to be a considerable amount of research that goes into the back end of this, I reckon that with enough data, you would be able to start to establish what is typical weight loss and what is the, the top end or the, or the most extreme weight loss that's possible and do elite athletes sometimes exceed that extreme end, maybe with 95 or 99% certainty, which would allow you to say that athlete needs further testing because it seems plausible that they're achieving that radical weight loss body fat percentage reduction only through doping. There'd be some other interesting applications of this. The, the sport, some of you may know that I'm involved in a lot these days, is rugby, and specifically injuries. And one of the theories that we're often faced with is that injuries are on the increase because players are getting bigger. Now, there's some data on this, and so this is an example of that. It shows you in English professional rugby the mass of the forwards and the backs. And what you see here is that over the last 10, 15 years, there's been a very slight increase, not much at all, in the average mass of those forwards and backs. What's missing from that graph is body composition because you can imagine that someone who weighs 110 kilograms today might be quite different from someone who weighed 110 kilograms 10, 15 years ago in the sense that they might have more muscle and less fat and that would have implications for the debate. So again, imagine we had a system that would track over time how the body fat, the muscle mass, the total mass changed in elite athletes. That would allow us to make these decisions and to have these discussions from an evidence-based point of view instead of having to talk theoretically and conceptually. So again, <laughs> I get there's dozens of reasons you could throw my way why this won't work. And logistical, practical, theoretical, I get it. But there's a couple of reasons why I think it would be very interesting and potentially worthwhile to explore. Water, if you do it, you owe me royalties. I'll be waiting for the check. Anyway, I'm going to break eight minutes, which is much better than usual, but I have taken too much of your time. So thanks for watching again, and do join me next time. Ciao.